Okay. <clears throat> so, yes, I am currently uh, on rotation at the National Science Foundation, um, but I'm supposed to start any talk that I give on my own research by saying this is not uh, National Science Foundation policy. <clears throat> I'm uh, here as a, uh, a faculty member from the University of Tennessee, so that's uh, uh, not to be taken as, as official word, uh, my point of view. Um, so this is, uh, first of all, thank you, and uh, I apologize for, for lecture speaking in, in English, but that's all I can do. Um, I, uh, this talk is is an architectural talk, so it really, uh, we heard uh, the uh, uh, a previous speaker talk about data flow from the bottom, I'm sorry, uh, workflow from the bottom up. This is, is, is defining where the bottom is perhaps even lower than, than had been anticipated and going um, really uh, uh, far down. Uh, this is work I've done with a number of collaborators over a number of years, as I'll say, but the, the particular work I'm presenting here is in collaboration with uh, Terry Moore, uh, Pyotr Luschek, and Anthony Denalis at the Innovative Computing Lab, which is also at the University of Tennessee. So this is uh, work that uh, I've been, been doing for a while. <laughs> I want to give a little context for this because it was was not originally uh, intended or started as, as work that was targeted at scientific workflows. Um, some 20 years ago, I started looking at the web as a distributed storage platform, really, and uh, was drawn to the idea of web caching as a way of, of uh, dealing with problems of what we came to call later data logistics. Uh, high latencies in, in storage access uh, in the wide area. Um, so some 15 years ago, we took a, an approach which said that doing it on a specific application level protocol, namely HTTP and HTTP uh, services, was too limiting, too restrictive. And we wanted to have a more infrastructure point of view. We wanted to be more like networking. And so we uh, we've uh, uh, developed what we uh, called logistical networking as essentially asynchronous communication. That is uh, adding uh, an attempt to add storage to the scalable model of networking, uh, doing what, as I'll explain, we've later come to understand is exposing buffers uh, that can be then flexibly managed for a number of different purposes. So how did we do this? We wanted something with the kind of success that we've seen in other infrastructures that, that's been very uh, influential, Unix and the internet. So we actually followed, oops, that was not good, I bumped it. Oh, there it is, okay, stay away from it. Oh, sorry, um, we actually followed the design patterns uh, that we found uh, that we, I had known from, from my own background in, uh, that was followed in Unix and the internet, uh, not in any really formal way, but just by looking at what had been done and, and trying to do the same thing in this context. Um, what we ended up with is uh, a, a service, which is, I'll, I'll come to describe a little, a little more, but it's, it's something like uh, taking a writable, uh, uh, anonymously writable FTP server and stripping it down to the very minimal uh, core of what you would need to make it a usable uh, and, and, and scalable network service. Uh, but in doing so, we really were wrestling with the architectural picture, how this, this element fit in with the internet, in which state in the middle of the network is, was, we were told, uh, forbidden by people in the networking community and uh, how it fit in also then with uh, the application, the stack of services that ultimately served applications. So uh, there was, I will say we were somewhat confused. We, we struggled a lot with figuring out uh, layering issues and eventually, though we've come to the picture which I think is, is clearer, although uh, perhaps still 
no less controversial. We'll see what you think. So we, we did a lot of experimentation with a lot of things that are similar to what we heard uh, even today, in situ uh, visualization, uh, buffering in asynchronous multicast, uh, what's now been uh, streaming across the wide area, these kinds of, uh, of things that we were doing uh, in, in pre-production or, or experimental uh, uh, context, what we eventually came to realize is that storage and also processing, which is part of this, are actually the elements that are used by routers, by low-level devices to implement the internet. And so what we were actually implementing in overlay on top of the internet, in some sense, was modeling those resources that, are, that exists in the wide area, but at a low level inside the, the nodes, and we'll, we'll get back to that. And in, in 2016, uh, I actually had some time to think for a while about the, the formalization of the question, if you're going to try to model those low-level resources in a way which is highly shareable and scalable, um, what design principles, this is harkening back to what we were doing when we were intuitively following Unix and, and the internet, could we make that formal and have some, some formal results about that? So that's the background. Um, a key element of this thinking about infrastructure uh, for use, as I said, not just in scientific uh, workflows, but across the entire spectrum of what is needed in in uh, by the global community that's users of cyber infrastructure, uh, in, uh, interoperation and the innovation that comes from common infrastructure is key. Okay, we've heard a lot about heterogeneity today, and specialization came up a lot in, in a previous talk. Um, those are very important for getting high performance and, and high levels of functionality for the application community, but they are very difficult elements when dealing with scalable infrastructure, with, with, with universality, if you will, uh, of deployment. So uh, uh, people looking at large-scale cyber infrastructure, in particular smart cities, uh, have, have uh, at least in some reports, um, have, have voiced a need for interoperation across the spectrum of, of different elements that are going to be used together uh, in order to foster innovation. And so that's really the, a key element uh, that is different about the point of view I'm going to put forward from much of what has, has come before. Um, that was actually supposed to be hidden. I'm going to skip that one. Too much history. Um, the, the picture uh, of silos is a very important one, the context of uh, information technology silos. Because uh, much of what goes on has gone on in distributed systems and in uh, wide area scientific computation is based on very mature silos uh, that provide us with many important uh, features. We have high performance, we have large scale of data, we have uh, scheduling, we have billing and metering, uh, various kinds of, of rather complex and specialized uh, features that go into what we, we think of today as particularly storage and computation Networking is, is a somewhat different uh, beast. It, we do have high-level services, file transfer, and uh, uh, other kinds of uh, now services uh, based on connection between higher-level uh, administrative domains, for instance, uh, when you have issues of resource allocation and billing. But the, the network itself it went through a transition when we went to the internet where we eliminated as much of the metering and billing and authentication 
at a low level as possible in order to give us interoperability. Storage and compute, as we well know, those elements are still uh, viewed as, as necessary and, and uh, form an important part of the functionality of high-level systems and of, frankly, the, often the difficulty of combining them and using them. But the usual approach to trying to combine systems in the wide area is what I call overlay convergence, where we take the high-level services at the top of these silos. At the bottom, we have the fundamental resources, disks, SSDs, flash drives, and the storage, compute are the, the cycles and, and the memories and, and networking we have bandwidth. We take the overlay, we take the high-level services, file systems and, and uh, file transfer in the case of networking, and we, we attempt to combine those through systems that, that make use of, of those services. And we often find that that is, can be frustrating, can be difficult uh, to, to combine those uh, different and specialized systems. So I'm going to show a picture here, which I'll come back to and explain more. But basically, the, the uh, structural claim I made, I'm, it's just an, an image of this. This is a picture which I hope is familiar to many of you of the architecture of the internet. And in the internet, uh, we have this notion that the internet protocol at layer three is uh, the communications uh, standard that all communication has to be expressed in terms of. But if we look at what makes it up, if we sort of look at the side, this side view, this, is, this communication service is actually constructed using storage and processing also because we have to. That's just a, a requirement in building the nodes that make up the network and the endpoints. But, but in, the, in the case of the network, those resources are minimized, are hidden from the communication service and not accessible. You cannot store data in the internet. You cannot process it there, except processing that is done, for instance, for checkpoints or other things. The, the view which I'm proposing is actually to expose the resources of nodes. At a, what is conceptually, architecturally, what is at a lower level below those global services and make them available to build global services, uh, making use of the, the local resources of all those nodes. So uh, that is, that is a, a view of getting our hands down underneath uh, the, what's now a communication uh, interface to what is really a data processing, a more general processing interface. So I'll come back to that, but that's kind of a peek ahead. And just mention, uh, put this in a couple of publica recent publications covering both the, the architectural view in this talk and also the formal points of view that, I'll, uh, that informs it. So the proposal is to define a common abstraction of the, internet technolo of the information technology node. Okay, so what is the information technology node? The claim is that all of the systems that we, we've shown pictures of um, today are made up of nodes in the network, its routers, in storage systems, its, its uh, storage object targets that, that hold uh, pieces of, uh, of storage uh, that are somewhat abstracted but are close to the, the storage uh, medium or, or uh, technology. And in computing, it is the, the cluster node. So th these are all nodes that in each case has been specialized to a particular type of, of use and building a particular system component which provides specialized high-level services. Um, we have mentioned convergence can occur at many levels. Operating systems converge the, the, func the services of these nodes at a high level. We, we use file systems which express a rather abstract view 
of what might be, might be many storage nodes and, and services that go on across them. Um, applications um, are also overlay over large numbers of, of nodes and clusters. Uh, so, so that is an approach which ends up uh, trying to recombine many different types of technologies that have been separated out into silos. Um, so that does a lot of things which lead to, to reuse of code that we've developed from, from simpler times. We, we have developed uh, ways of, of giving ourselves reliability, even in large systems in which system failures, component failures, uh, have become common because of the complexity and size of the systems. Um, performance, we've tuned the performance of each part uh, to a high level. We've concerned ourselves with fairness, particularly in the network, but also in operating system scheduling. Uh, permanence in storage. We've worked on RAID, we've worked on other types of uh, checkpointing, backup facilities. These are all rather complex and high level services. So we get all of these things out by using the high level uh, services that have been developed over really decades, so many decades. But the convergence to the high level, trying to combine those services essentially through their, their user or application interfaces, limits the level of interoperability you can get. When you're going through a file system, if you want control over what happens on the medium, you may not have very much of it because the view of a file as a, a large, uh, linear extent of data has abstracted away from all those troublesome details, but also uh, there's a lot of control that has been lost, for example. And by using those specialized interfaces, we have gotten away from ubiquity. When we have, for instance, file systems that are developed for uh, uh, implementing parallel operations in high performance data centers, uh, the model there may be very different from an edge node where what you need is, is very lightweight and uh, perhaps transient storage. So we have this issue of code portability and of, of different interfaces. So what we're proposing is a converged common abstraction around what is the common element of what all these nodes do. They're so different, they've been specialized. Well, our, our, our suggestion is it's about buffers. In all these cases, what we look at is buffers, meaning either areas of memory or storage, say a page, an element in a, in a storage system, that, that all of these different kinds of nodes are in their specialized ways managing buffers in different ways. And everything they do can be defined as the aggregate, aggregation of small operations on buffers. Now, uh, what does that mean? We'll, we'll go a little bit into more detail, but uh, the examples of the buffers that we're talking about, in the network, we of course have line buffers for data moving in and out of the router, but also Pages of memory are a form of buffer, which can be used if we're not on the fast path in moving data through a router. But even on a router, there's storage, which is used for administrative purposes. It's all there. And the router is a way of using all of them to provide a communication service. Um, in storage, of course, we have storage pages or, or blocks. So that we're also calling a kind of buffer. Now you could say that's very different from a line buffer. Line buffer is implemented with a different technology and it is managed in a very different way. But we're saying it's an area of storage, of per permanence, of persistence, which you allocate, you write into, and you read from. And that's still, that's true of a disk block it's true of flash memory. And so we're looking to make use of that commonality in building the common abstraction. In processing, you might say, okay, we understand 
the use of buffers and caches, uh, disk caches, that, that's part of what an operating system does. Uh, but how is processing about buffers? And what we ask you to, at least for the purpose of this talk, make the leap, the pages that make up a process are buffers. And what is happening to them during execution? We're transforming the data in them. And how are we transforming them through execution of, the, of a processor for some time slice? So even though we think of a process as a, a unit that goes from the beginning of execution to the end of execution, we're saying that the actual unit of allocation of a processor is, in the case of a multitasking operating system, a time slice. And we operate on, actually, if we have a single core, one buffer at a time. If we have multiple cores, we operate on one, one buffer, one page for each core that's executing. So in all cases, these are buffers which are part of the node, the model of the node, what we're calling the local layer. So this is a, an unusual view of infrastructure. This is, this is trying to find this commonality. And I just very quickly want to point out that the optimization that one gets from looking at buffers as being interoperable, uh, we know about it. We make use of it, for instance, in operating systems. So in the Linux operating system, we have different kinds of buffers. We have file buffers, we have network buffers, we have pages of processes. And uh, traditionally, what happened if you wanted to read a file from the file system and move it out onto the network is that the file system moved data from disk blocks, which is actually one kind of buffer, to a file buffer which is in memory, which is dedicated to that purpose. But from there, one had to move it into memory through a read in order to then move it out, out, of, out of main memory, out of the, the page, into another specialized piece of memory, namely the, the socket buffer, in order to move it out onto the network. That comes from a specialization within the operating system, even, that separates file and socket buffers and pages. Uh, at, at some point, it was recognized that one can improve performance by having a common view of the buffers, allowing process pages to be used directly to read uh, from disk and to write out to the network, and not, not doing that extra copying. So um, this is just a, a, a hopefully somewhat familiar context for pointing out that buffer interoperability is something that we use to get performance. And this is something that we're um, looking to generalize. So why? Why do we want all this generality? Why do we want to talk about mechanisms that have been devised over time, honed, to, for high performance, for high functionality, why in the world would we want to have an abstraction which was common that unified all of them? The idea we get is from the design of the internet. The idea that thin waste of the hourglass that I showed you, what's called the spanning layer. And the idea is if you, if you want to have interoperability among many different functions that use a common resource, you have a choice. You can translate between the different implementations you have. As I said, uh, in the Linux view, we had to actually do transfers in order to move between buffers. If you have n different forms of the same service, you're going to have order n squared uh, translations. If instead you choose a common model, a common interface, and, and have everything all the applications that use that resource, use that common interface, you then uh, cut out those translations. Okay? And you have a thin waste, you have network effects. And that is the basis of the, the waste, the, the uh, thin waste of the hourglass model in the internet and many other operating systems. The Unix kernel interface is such an example. Uh, it, it's, it's a way of getting portability, 
interoperability, uh, generality out of infrastructure. You always have the same problem. What about the specializations and optimizations that are given up? The answer is you have, you have some trade-offs to make, okay? Uh, what you can hope is that when you go to a common model, you can preserve enough of your application functionality to justify that move, and that you can, through later optimization and implementation tricks that come around that common interface, get back performance and get back the, the higher level functions that were based on the silos. Um, that's a leap of faith <laughs> to uh, change your stack on the basis of architectural design ideas can be a very hard sell. Like I said, we've been working on this for 20 years. Um, but we ask you to look at the internet. We ask you to look at Unix and ask about the, the benefits that have come around the notion of adopting a common layer. So if you're going to have a common layer, that's one way of looking at uh, the thin waste. It's, it's a single common interface. Uh, but there's more to the design principles than that, if you go back and, and look at the history. And that's the notion of keeping that thin waste minimal, keeping it simple, keeping it very general, and actually limiting the, the resources, at least uh, allowing it, the, the implement, the, the provider of resources, to limit what can be allocated at one time. Those have all been keys, both in the case of Unix and in the case of, of, of the internet, of making that common interface a scale, making it something that eventually uh, was useful across all, implement, all uh, application categories. <clears throat> so the idea is uh, we want to overcome barriers. We want to eventually have an interface that gets adopted in different, different technological imp implementations, different application groups, because having that common interface uh, is worth more than giving up whatever specializations uh, the, the, the predecessors had. So we want to have commonality not through regulation, but through uh, voluntary adoption because of design. So what's always been done is to converge at a low layer, okay? to, to find the commonality between uh, different stacks and, and converge there. Expose underlying resources. Uh, the resources that were exposed by the Unix kernel were not available to application processes in previous operating systems in, in before Unix. Uh, datagrams were present in circuit-based networking, and it was considered actually by some implementers, there's a famous quote from Sandy Frazier, uh, the implementer of uh, ATM, that exposing packets directly to end users was an irresponsible way to run a network. Okay, so uh, th there's been real pushback from doing that. But what we find is you give, you give application designers, particularly scientists, more direct access to the tools they need to, to control the computing platforms they're on, and that allows them to solve their own problems, uh, whether it's directly the application programmer or through a stack of services uh, like we've seen uh, described here, which are specialized to, to their particular needs. So both Unix and the internet followed that kind of uh, approach. Okay, so this is the... Uh, just briefly touch on the, the formal design principle that I, I did some work on. Um, and this is a paper that is uh, going to be coming out in communications of the ACM, I'm told, in July. Uh, and basically, it's a theorem that can be proved, which has to do with weakness, actually logical weakness. If you consider the description of the service of the spanning layer as a theory in um, program logic, which is one way of formalizing the idea of an API, 
is describing what the functionality is in a, in a formal sense, you can talk about how strong or weak it is. Having a stronger API uh, means there are more features, there's more control given to applications. Having a weaker one means there is, uh, there's less of that. There is, uh, um, there, there is less direct control over low-level resources through that interface. Um, the, the theorem says that if you have a, a weak spanning layer, that actually reduces the class of applications that you can support. That's the bad news. But it broadens, it increases the class of implementations of that interface. Okay. And so uh, if you look at what happens, for instance, in the design of Unix or the internet, there were decisions made that certain kinds of applications had to be supported, but other classes perhaps we could do without. Uh, in particular, quality of service requirements, applications that had strong quality of service provide, uh, requirements were ruled out of the design of the internet uh, in order to weaken, in order to be able to weaken the, the, uh, the spanning layer, the common interface, and then Having chosen the, the, the functionality you need to give to applications, you just choose the weakest spanning layer you can design that supports that in order to give you the broadest class of possible implementations. That may, may sound, in some sense, people say, well, it's, it's not that surprising, although, uh, uh, or, or it just seems like, like uh, good layered system design, but finding the weakest interface can be actually rather, uh, rather hard. And asking yourself what application services you might give up in order to get a broad class of implementations uh, is sometimes a question that uh, people realize maybe that they are they are making assumptions and requiring things of the platforms there are that they may be uh, nervous about giving up. So um, in order to, if we say that, that weakening the, span, the spanning layer reduces, in some sense, the class of applications that we may be able to support, we want the broadest class possible one thing we can do is move that spanning layer as far down as possible in the stack to get our hands on low-level resources. And so this gives us the picture of wanting to, to reduce the level and, 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 and work at, a, at a, uh, a more fundamental level in uh, how we manage resources. And that gets us to this idea here of um, we, we, we actually don't like to give to, to call it the link layer or layer two when we're talking about storage and processing also, because it's too evocative of, of the networking context. We call it the local layer. The, the point is, what is the local layer in a node? You can think of it roughly as the operating system that's in a router that's on a compute node and is in a, a storage uh, uh, object target. And so we give the name exposed buffer processing to what we're proposing. Uh, the idea is uh, that we have buffers that we're going to expose, implemented in different technologies, but that, that is how we're going to refer to them, not as files, not as uh, process images, uh, not, as, uh, uh, not as flows, but as buffers full of data. Uh, a, a buffer is either in a node, or it can, one can refer to a buffer that's in a neighboring node, where the notion of neighboring is thought of roughly as an analogy to local area networking, although it, it could be broader than that but it doesn't have to be global. So you start out with nodes where you know their connectivity, you know their storage and processing abilities, 
and we uh, model those in a weak way that is best effort. We want to know uh, what can the device do for us, not what kind of service can we build on top of that device. We want to expose as much as possible the characteristic, characteristic of each device and what it does to buffers. So, and we allow those limits actually to be manipulated by the owner of the node. So what is the, the kind of, of limit? The, 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 when it comes to storage, which is where we started with all this, we say uh, you don't have to allow permanent alloc allocation of storage. You can make it time limited. You can make it a lease. So that weakens the notion of what storage allocation is and we allow the owner to put limit on what that time limit, what that time allocation is. Much the way that the owner of a router can set the uh, maximum transfer unit of, of a datagram that goes through the router, we might say, okay, you can have, you can allocate a block of storage. There's some maximum size, there's some maximum duration, and I'm gonna give it to you with best effort. Uh, if, my, if I have a certain fault rate within my uh, uh, devices, I may just expose that directly to the end user. So that's, that's the weak aspect. And so this actually what the things that one does on a buffer are fairly few and fairly straightforward. One allocates it, one writes to it and reads from it, um, transfers between buffers, both local or between a node and a neighboring node, and one can apply an operation to a buffer. So what is an operation? An operation that transforms the contents of the buffer. Um, it could be as simple as XOR. One takes two buffers full of data, uh, applies XOR, and produces an output which is the uh, the, the exclusive or of them. That is, that is maybe the simplest example. But actually, one can have more complicated notions of operations and support them, things that uh, do more transformation, more computation. You can even support virtual machine models as a way of transforming buffers full of data or even ne native execution. So this view is, we. W we want to have different ways of transforming buffers, uh, but the operation is, again, it can be limited, and even though it could involve indefinite execution of a process, uh, we think that that is probably not a good idea. Instead, one wants to put time limits on how, how long one can allocate the processor for, and then concatenate those operations. So this is, this is actually something that people have a hard time wrapping their head around. The notion is this, just to paraphrase, if I'm gonna put a node out in the middle of the network, I, if I'm just gonna allow indefinite allocation of storage and people to put indefinitely running processes on it, it's gonna be overused and, and un, unmanageable very quickly, particularly if I'm not in the mood to implement user IDs and require authentication for people who want to use it. But if I say, here's a limit on the size of, an, of a, a, an allocation of memory or storage, here's a limit on how much operation you can do at one time, and then you're gonna have to do multiple requests to get longer running operations. And I don't allow you to place a process there that's gonna run autonomously until it's finished, well, then maybe that node can be shared by a number of different uses. They're going to contend. You'd say, that sounds, that sounds kind of, uh, how, how would that be a way of sharing computational resources? It's an analogy to the way we share bandwidth. Rather than setting up circuits and just uh, uh, using them at their capacity for as long as we want, we send one datagram at a time and we send large numbers of datagrams, and each datagram is best effort, and we deal with the aggregation at the endpoints. That's how we've gotten it to work. It's an analogy, actually. Uh, Unix uh, process execution is more controlled, but there are a lot of elements there which are modeled 
of by fair contention, for instance, contention for, for the processor between multiple processes that, that are similar in this kind of, of approach for how we do allocation. Is there an overhead? Yes. Uh, do we get the peak performance at all times? Uh, not if we have, uh, if, if, if we have the, the less controlled forms of allocation. But what do we get? We get commonality, we get the ability to innovate. So let's talk more about that. The, the, the picture we're painting, it's kind of a, a, uh, an analogy, is if you think about networking, transferring datagrams, which are a form of buffer, because a datagram exists in a buffer on every node that it passes through, we want to think of storage as like networking, but passing data through time instead of through space. So physicists like that. And in fact, we even think of data transformation as moving the datagram through the space of possible values stored in a buffer. Okay? So in all these cases, we're trying to make an analogy to take what we think of as discrete steps and be able to think of them all as transformations on buffers. So part of what one does when one exposes buffers and exposes buffer operations is you have to expose topology. And I put topology in quotes because it's not just communication, connectivity topology. You also have a, a picture of the availability of resources in storage and in processing. And you need to know what is where in order to be able to schedule. Uh, that is what the, the, uh, is not available to users of the internet uh, because routing, global routing hides network topology. And it's also a real problem in the communication and the processor stacks. Um, so we need to know both the static topology and dynamic because we need to know what the levels of current uses are to know what's available at any time. And the effective management of workflows requires knowledge and perhaps even control, although that takes longer, over this generalized topology. So that is part of the argument for why working at the top of the silo is too restrictive. You don't get to see the low-level topology. You don't know if you have a large file, what blocks, what, what devices each block is residing on. And that can be part of doing the scheduling you need to do. In the architecture, as I say, applications are not topologically informed. You might have important, some applications for which wide area performance is so important that they, in fact, take a peek at the topology in various ways. We do that in high performance networking. And when we do that, we are breaking the rules of the internet architecture and essentially uh, creating our own network out of the pieces of the internet because we're, we're peeking into the topology and perhaps controlling the topology in ways that are not actually part of that architecture. So, giving you a lot of generalities, a lot of the design of this, let's talk about one example, content delivery. This is, this is an illustrative example. It's not about scientific workflows. We'll get to that next. But content delivery is a case that comes up because the internet is not good at doing the thing that now the commercial world needs it to do more than anything, which is to move data from one source to a huge number of different uh, uh, destinations or huge amounts of data to many different destinations. It's the, it's the, the idea, the amount of traffic and the fact that it's passing multiple times over the network. And doing that with point-to-point -point transmissions, uh, one after the other, is, is redundant, is inefficient, and even in today's network, that's not actually how it's done. Uh, in, it results in bottlenecks within the network if you try to do that, and uh, poor user performance. So what content delivery networks do is to create a, 
proprietary network of servers which act as intermediate nodes in a private network and they make copies of the data that we all want to access, Netflix, um, com commercial data, uh, uh, commercial websites, those kinds of things, and uh, deploy them throughout the network and actually arrange for each end user to be directed to a replica that is topologically close to them in violation of the rules of global routing by manipulating the DNS. Uh, uh, the, the domain name service. <clears throat> so um, that's an example in which we're doing something in which the intermediate nodes, you can think of those servers as very large, expensive, proprietary intermediate nodes, but they're, they are being used uh, in a, a, a more general way with both their storage and processing capacity being used. So that's one example where the commercial world has gone around the rules of the internet and is essentially building their own network, now using the internet mainly for edge access to reach end users uh, and, 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 and manipulating topology themselves. Okay, so let's look at something maybe more familiar, streaming and workflows. So classic uh, workflow model, as we've heard, they work at a high level. Um, storage is modeled as files. Communication is file transfer. Computation are jobs in a scheduler. So um, what's wrong with that? As we've heard, we can have problems staging data locally when we need to ingest it into a supercomputer. And the actual requirements of this super, supercomputer are not for localization of data, but what I call run readiness, which means when you do a read, you don't have to block waiting for data to cross the wide area network. But that can be actually addressed by streaming. So we have streaming starting to be uh, introduced into workflow managers, into wide area managers, uh, but streaming is very complicated. And streaming requirements are very different depending on the nature of the application and the I.O. Uh, style. And so how are we going to get portability? How are we going to get interoperability in streaming uh, when it is such a complex, specialized kind of a, a service? Well, we could wait for POSIX to standardize all the possibilities and put it into the standard uh, Linux interface and hands up everyone who is willing to hold their breath until that happens. Okay, I didn't think so. Uh, very slow process, that standardization of high level uh, interfaces. Another possibility is you expose the low level resources out of which streams are built, namely buffers. Buffers at the endpoints, buffers in the middle of the network, uh, storage, buffers or, or blocks, you expose all of them and you allow now a stack of services, such as a data flow, I'm sorry, workflow manager, to build up the scheduling, the strategy that's needed by the application out of those pieces. Okay, so it's, it's really allowing those tools to reach down farther to the more fundamental uh, resources and do with them what they need to do. So here's a picture, just because the, the, the processing part is really the part of this picture that people have the hardest time understanding and is most disturbing. So the picture on your left is the normal picture of what we might have. Actually, this is a distribution tree for, for distributing data from the root, say, out into the, the leaves, and we place a process on each node normally running there. That's a familiar kind of thing. We, we've heard about it in streaming processors. Uh, it's, it's a common thing. The picture with exposed buffer processing is those nodes, all they do is what they're told. There is no long running process on each node, but there's some kind of a manager. Here it's shown as centralized, but the, the point is it could be as centralized or decentralized as is needed but that manager is controlling 
the flow of data within those nodes, the, the placement of data, the movement of data between the nodes, is in the manager. Okay? And the idea, why would one do such a thing, is that those nodes are more generic, are more passive, are more easily managed, are more easily defined in a way which won't have to change and be updated constantly because the manager is doing so much of the work in a way which is not permanently embedded in the infrastructure or even persistently embedded in the infrastructure. So we have in edge processing, we have this data deluge at the edge so that we tend to be working in the other direction than, than I showed in the picture. And um, we, have, we have huge amounts of data coming in from the edge and we need to do in transit operations, filtering, uh, uh, compression, other kinds of things. We need uh, uh, thin clients as shared infrastructure uh, uh, at near the edge, so they have to be shared across many different application types, which means embedding functionality out there, even for the duration of long-running job, can be a huge administrative overhead and a huge difficulty in authorization and, and billing and metering, it's, it's a real barrier to deployment. Um, the idea of using trust, so what is trust about? Uh, sometimes what you need in order to be able to trust enough to share is to reduce reduce the value of what is shared, okay, at least at one time, and then share repeatedly. This is what we do with, with, the, with the network, with datagrams. So then we can contend fairly, and we can, we can monitor that contention. That's what we do with firewalls. And, and we can make use of as much cooperation as we can get in the community of application uh, implementers. So in the scientific community, we're, we make use of this idea often that we have some community with some kind of trust and then in this case we're saying, but you, you make the resource that you're sharing, you craft it so it is more shareable. And that's, that's how it works with land resources and with OS resources in situations where you have, uh, for instance, time sharing traditionally. So what, what might an operation look like? I gave sort of extreme examples. XOR is a simple operation. Execution of a Java virtual machine or even x86 uh, native execution, those are very um, specialized types of transformations of buffers. In the case of, for instance, filtering of data coming from the edge in order to re reduce the amount of traffic across the network, I won't go into the details here, but the idea is an operation may do simple filtering based on actual inspection of fields within a record. Okay, that might be what is being, in a sense, executed on the node by that manager. Okay, so that's in situ processing. So in that case, we then augment the picture on the right. We have a little thing that's supposed to look like a functional unit, like an ALU, and the manager is not only giving movement operations, it's actually issuing those filtering operations out onto those nodes. So you might say, okay, get the idea. I get the idea of how having those nodes loaded only with generic operations and having the manager invoke those operations gives us generality. How in the world are you gonna get performance out of that? How are you going? two major ways that we've done it experimentally. One is by making large aggregate operations, even if they're simple, if they're aggregate, you get performance back. And then using the same techniques we use in uh, processors with deep pipelining, namely, I mean, with, with, with latencies, we use pipelining and caching to make those, those nodes that are actually executing filter operations to eliminate the latency of the issuing of, of instructions, of, of operations from the manager. 
don't have time here to go over that in detail, but we were able to do merging of timestamp streams, records with timestamps on them, uh, at line speed using that technique, using buffering and caching techniques. So you don't place a process to run in an optimized, in a fully optimized way persistently, but you do use some state management in the form of caching and, and pipelining to eliminate the issues of latency and get back some of the performance you've given up by not placing processes. Just to remind people, people say, oh, but I've got, I've got a, a stack that does so much for me, you're asking me to give that up. I have a file system that's reliable, and you're asking me to use an object store that you're telling me is best effort. <laughs> Why in the world would I do that? Why would I use less than what I, the best I have available? The thing to remember is every resource you're currently using is best effort, <laughs> almost by definition, at the low level. There is some stack that's been built to hide that from you, and that does you the favor of making you not see the faults and the other uh, limitations of the low level resource, but it also takes away flexibility. What we're suggesting is actually rebuilding that stack, but in a way that is less siloed, so that we can work across the silos of storage processing and networking and optimize them in ways that designers of the current stack never foresaw. But ultimately, um, you can't get away from the fact that the small pieces that we're composing are best effort, are limited, and are faulty. Um, again, some analogies. A datagram, you can think of it like a process that's migrating across nodes. Okay? That's part of the, the interoperability. Storage system, you could say it does no computation. Wrong. Storage system is working hard to compute the identity function. It's computing parity or it's computing uh, different forms of RAID. It's doing anti-aliasing, uh, uh, checking to make sure that corruption hasn't happened. It's not working as hard as a compute cluster, but there is computation going on there. And a job is actually executing as a, a concatenation of time slices. So um, then we have to work to get back those high-level requirements. And our current stack software, maybe it can be adapted, some of it will have to be rewritten, sorry. That's just, we can try to keep some of the programming interfaces the same so that we can support legacy code, but this suggestion um, is, is going to require us to do a lot of work. And I'm just about done. Here's a picture, which I, I give uh, some credit to, to Francois for. Part of the idea here when going from edge to center, I found this little generic looking symbol. Question is, can we build all of that out of interoperable pieces? Is that possible? That's the challenge. And this over here is supposed to be a supercomputer full of nodes in a regular array. So in conclusion, the divergence between the silos is a historical effect. It's not inevitable. The underlying pieces have a lot of commonality. Uh, optimization across those silos, one way or another, it's necessary. And convergence at the local layer is a very powerful way of allowing us to work across those categories. Heterogeneity is, is a key to doing different things on top of a local, of a, of a common interface, which means we have to implement the common interface at a low level. And um, it's the locality, exposing locality, that enables the control over, over what is done uh, and, and still gives flexibility. Thank you. So, is there a question for Mika? Yes? Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot for this very refreshing talk, so promoting weakness in this world of power, so that for a 
variety of, of implementation that's yeah, really nice. Something I didn't get is, so do you abandon as well the um, heterogeneity of hardware? So you would advo advocate for a uniformity of hardware or is hardware specialization still in the picture for you? No, hardware specialization is, is definitely still in, in the picture. The, the idea though is that um, we're going to, uh, what, what, is, what shows through this common interface is a performance of different kinds of operations. So storage, all, basically all storage looks very, can be look very similar. So read, write, allocate is the basics. Um, the, the transforming operations, uh, they can be very, very heterogeneous. And in fact, not all of them have to be implemented on every node. We just want common definitions. So the idea is, I mean, if you, ha if you want to implement XOR, it's going to be the same everywhere. But the implementation could even be different. You could have vector machines that, that, that implement it on large amounts, areas of memory in, in a highly specialized way. You could have an x86 implementation. That could be one of your operations. But you have to know that that's not going to be, you're not going to get as much universality out of that. But if you even want a GPU, uh, include that then in the operations that, a G, that model what a GPU does, uh, again, knowing that, that, that you may not get that on every node. So there's, the idea is that the notion of uniformity in, in the interface is the way of getting maximum interoperability and portability. If you move away from that to specialization, you have, it's, it's up to then you to, to live with the restriction in, in uh, universality that you will get. One, yes. Th then you have many, many different implementations, but those operations that are standard will run wherever you have one of those implementations. I mean, there are many, many in different implementations of Linux, right? Yet, yet we get portability out of writing code, not knowing which one of those it will execute on. There are many, many implementations of the of internet uh, datagram forwarding. It's one of the great things about it. But we, we gave up the ability to get the specialization out of each underlying LAN uh, uh, technology in order to get universality. It seemed to have paid off. OK. We, thank you. We are going to stop there. <laughs>